Amos Chacham on Psalm 24. What is Psalm 24? Why, why is it significant for us? Anybody know? Come on. Come on. What do we do with Psalm 24? I'll share it on the screen why it's important. Who is Amos Chacham? And what do you say about Psalm 24? You want to guess? No? Okay. Yes, it's the Psalm for the first day. That means every day in the temple, the the Levites are supposed to sing Psalm 24 along with the Talmud offering, morning and afternoon. So yes, now you're familiar with it. So what is it about Psalm 24? What what is it used anywhere else in Jewish liturgy? And who was Amos Chacham? So let me put this on the screen for everybody. Actually, I don't need to put this on screen. We'll say it by heart. Psalm 24 is the Psalm of the day for Sunday. When else do we say it? So if you look in, let's say, your article sitter, it's actually quite a quite a few places. It's part of Kabbalah Shabbos. It's that last psalm before L'Chadodi. Right? No, no, sorry. I got, it must be being so wrong. You made a mistake now. I'll show it to you. Maybe Psalm 28 saying. Got that wrong. Hold on one second. Psalm 24 is, yeah, with David Mizmor. Okay? It is correct. It is the psalm of the day. And we say it when we put, uh, it's not Mizmor Le David. It's Le David Mizmor. I got confused. We don't say it at Kabbalah Shabbos. I'm confusing that. When you put the Torah back on weekdays, you say Le David Mizmor. Okay? And on Shabbos is uh, Mizmor Le David. Okay? I got them confused. They're right next to each other there. I'll show it to you on the screen. Le David Mizmor. Mizmor Le David is said on Shabbos twice. Okay? Le David Mizmor, this psalm, is 24. So this is what you say when you put the Torah back. Where else does this come up? So Amos Chacham, I'll explain to you who he was uh, for a little bit. He was uh, Kishmo Kenhu. I think he was a little bit of a, a shut-in back in the 1950s. He had a little bit of a difficult childhood. Uh, I think he was a little kfad pair, whatever it was. But he was a very smart guy, and he spent all his time studying Tanakh. Yeah, yeah, okay. So he spent all his time studying Tanakh, and he came to fame because he won the first National Bible Contest. And suddenly realized that this shy you know, loner, who wasn't uh, as eloquent as people thought he was, was actually a genius in Tanakh. And he, he was like, uh, before he could just do Google searches and things like that, he was fielding questions from everybody who knew everything. And he was part of the original editorial staff of the Das Mik Rabbi Musada Rav Kook. And he's, uh, whatever, he's, he has a, quite a legacy. And he worked on the Perush for quite a few of the volumes of uh, Das Mikra. You guys study Das Mikra? I mentioned it before. I, I feel it's indispensable. I went to, I visited a yeshiva this week for the first time I was there. I could not find any Das Mikra on their base matters or in their library, except for the Chumash Das Mikra. But none of the volumes of Tanakh. I was shocked. And they also seemed to lack, they had plenty of art scrolls in their base matters. Also, a lot of art scrolls, completely Israeli. So they have this, now we have a full set of Schottenstein as of today. Okay, that's not, that wasn't my doing. Other people wanted it. It used to be having art scrolls around in the base matters was, was sort of an embarrassment. Uh, like I said, my Rebbe was okay with art scrolls. He even asked me to procure him a Gemara Shabbos once. He wanted to see it before he uh, went went for his drive. So that's fine. I I like Steinzaltz more for Gemaras. You know, if you're if you're not going to be using the regular Vilna edition, so use Steinzaltz because what's the first advantage that Steinzaltz has over art scroll? First and most important advantage, Steinzaltz put back the censored things. Art scroll didn't put back the censored sections. So if you use the regular Vilna or an art scroll, let's say on for Avodazara or Sanhedrin, you did not learn, you did not finish that Masechta. Steinzaltz puts back like Sonsino. And uh, Steinzaltz also, you know, put in the dots and everything. It's a bigger print, at least the original Steinzaltz, so you could use those. So Amos Chacham was involved in this production. In 1980, he created uh, his parish on Tehillim. So I really like that. That's one. That's the first volume of Das Mikra I owned. I got it in English. Someone gave it to me in America. And then when I came to Israel, I bought the Hebrew version. And uh, that's still uh, all the other Das Mikras I have, but I've collected them over the years. That was the first one and the only one I actually went to a farm store to buy. Hmm. So Amos Chacham has a footnote there on Psalm 24, a very telling footnote. Psalm 24, if you look at your art scroll Moxer, is said the night of Rosh Hashanah. And this is what I've seen growing up. They say this psalm uh, uh, line by line, right? <coughs> right? 
So wait a second. Amos Chacham there writes, he makes notes in all every psalm at the end when it's used in the liturgy. He says, so this psalm, according to the practice of the Spartan and the Hasidim, is said the night of Rosh Hashanah in conjunction with this prayer for, for uh, sustenance, for, uh, uh, no, what's the word? Uh, livelihood, Parnassah. Man, getting my English. Parnassah, the prayer for Parnassah, which is a livelihood, right? God should give us what we need. That is what he says. And he, he actually says this twice. He mentions Hasidim and Spartan. Hasidim are a group of Ashkenazim. Amos Chacham and the editorship of Morsad Rav Kook apparently did not know yet that Ashkenazic groups had already put this into their machzer and into their service on the night of Rosh Hashanah because to them, writing in Jerusalem in 1980, this still wasn't a practice of Ashkenazic Jews and had yet to appear in their machzor. So this is just another good example of, wait a minute, when you say you want to daven Ashkenaz, min, nusach, on Rosh Hashanah, and you're going to be saying that, comes to choice, say this, this psalm or not say the psalm, and your shtick is, we're going to be Ashkenaz and we're not Spartan and we're not Hasidim, so you should leave it out. It's a recent addition. And like we saw in Ramosha Feinstein's Tshuva, Nusach Svart is just a collection of changes that he himself could not justify. That Sure, the Rebbe must have had some justification, but if you want to stick to real classical Nusach Ashkenaz, which is the right way to go about doing it, by the way, such that if someone wants to give up these Hasidish bin Hagim, that's even better. Better to just stick with the traditional Ashkenazic rite, R-I-T-E, than a Hasidish rite, in Rav Moshe's opinion. So this is just one another example of that the art scroll mocksers, and I think even it, it, Birnbaum had it also, by the way. Birnbaum is from the 50s and 40s, but I don't think Amos Chacham and the Musadar of Kukniks had a copy of Birnbaum's Moxer. Why? For, for whom was Birnbaum's Moxer created? For Americans. It's an American Moxer with an English translation. There's no reason why someone in Jerusalem who's a native Hebrew speaker would pick up a, a Birnbaum Moxer. They probably might not even have. I have a few at home. They made their way to, to Israel, but uh, it's not their thing. So that's a case in point. Just another example of something that people would probably think, this is, you know, straight up our minhug. It is not. As late as 42 years ago, major writers were still assuming that this is not part of our service. We would like to encourage our viewers to share these videos with friends and send in your responses. If you would like to obtain Birkon Nusach Eretz Israel or invite the rabbi for a speaking engagement, please email us at office at machonchilo.org.